Moon. Duncan Jones's 2009 directorial debut about isolation and corporate exploitation. Sam Rockwell plays Sam Bell, a lone astronaut nearing the end of his three-year contract, mining helium-3 on the lunar surface. His only companion is Gertie, an artificial intelligence voiced by Kevin Spacey. Sam starts experiencing hallucinations and health problems as his departure date approaches. Then he discovers another Sam Bell outside the base. Injured in a rover accident, the two Sams realize they're clones, disposable workers created by Lunar Industries to avoid the expense of transporting employees to and from the moon. Each clone is implanted with false memories of a wife and daughter, programmed to believe they'll return to Earth after their contract ends. Instead, they're incinerated and replaced with a fresh clone every three years. The film cost only $5 million, but looks like a $50 million production through clever miniature work and practical effects. Jones, David Bowie's son, crafted an intimate psychological thrill that explores identity and humanity without relying on spectacle. Rockwell delivers a tour de force performance, playing multiple versions of the same person with distinct personalities shaped by their position in the clone cycle. The film asks whether memories define personhood or if consciousness exists independent of experience. Gertie's ambiguous loyalty, programmed to help the current Sam, regardless of corporate interest, subverts expectations about AI antagonists. Moon proved science fiction could work on a micro-budget by prioritizing ideas and performance over visual effects. It launched Jones's career and demonstrated that thoughtful, character-driven sci-fi could find an audience despite minimal marketing and limited theatrical release. Sunshine, Danny Boyle's 2007 film about a desperate mission to reignite the dying sun. 50 years in the future, the sun is failing, plunging Earth into a deadly ice age. The spaceship Icarus II carries a stellar bomb designed to jumpstart solar fusion, humanity's last hope after the Icarus I disappeared seven years earlier. The international crew includes Killian Murphy as physicist Robert Kappa, responsible for detonating the payload. Chris Evans plays engineer Mace, Rose Byrne is pilot Cassie, and Hiroyuki Sanada is Captain Kaneda. The mission falls apart through a series of escalating disasters. A navigation error forces them to change course to intercept Icarus Icarus 1, hoping to salvage its bomb as backup. During a spacewalk to repair damaged solar shields, Kaneda sacrifices himself to save the mission. The crew boards Icarus 1 and discovers its crew died in a religious fervor, believing they should accept humanity's extinction as divine will. The ship's captain, Pinbacker, survived and secretly boards Icarus 2. The film shifts from hard science fiction to slasher horror in its third act as Pinbacker, horribly burned and deranged, starts killing crew members. This tonal shift divided audiences and critics who had embraced the film's first two acts. Boyle consulted with physicist Brian Cox to ensure scientific accuracy in depicting space travel and solar physics. The film flopped at the box office, despite strong reviews, earning around $35 million worldwide against a $40 million budget. Cinematographer Alwyn Cooper Kukler created stunning visuals of solar radiation and deep space. The ending shows Kappa manually detonating the bomb, succeeding in his mission as he's consumed by solar fire. Sunshine remains polarizing because of its horror turn, but it's a visually magnificent meditation on sacrifice and humanity's will to survive. Coherence. James Ward Burkett's 2013 micro-budget thriller shot over five nights for $50,000. Eight friends gather for a dinner party on the night a comet passes overhead. Strange things begin happening immediately. The power goes out. Cell phones start breaking. A window shatters. Someone finds a box outside containing photos of each person at the party and numbered ping pong balls. The group realizes another house two blocks away has power and two volunteers walk there to investigate. They return shaken, reporting they saw themselves through the window. The comet has created a quantum decoherence event where multiple realities exist simultaneously in overlapping space. 
Walking outside the dark zone brings you to a different reality, a house with different versions of the same people making different choices. The friends start encountering alternate selves, some injured, some hostile, some desperate. They develop a system using the ping pong balls and glow sticks to identify which reality they're from. But people get mixed up and paranoia builds. M, played by Emily Foxler, discovers a reality where her alternate self is happier, more confident in a better relationship with her boyfriend, Kevin. Rather than return to her original reality, M decides to replace this better version of herself. She finds the house, drugs her alternate self, and violently attacks her off screen. M then takes her place at the table with this reality's versions of her friends. The final scenes show M trying to act normal as the friends notice small inconsistencies in her behavior and memory. She's trapped in a reality that isn't hers, having committed quantum murder to steal someone else's life. Burkett gave actors different information each night, creating genuine confusion and tension. The dialogue was largely improvised based on scenarios Burkett outlined. The film transforms a high-concept science fiction premise into a moral horror story about desperation and the darkness of wanting someone else's life badly enough to kill for it. Predestination The Spirig Brothers' 2014 adaptation of Robert Heinlein's classic short story, All You Zombies. Ethan Hawke plays a temporal agent who travels through time, preventing crimes before they happen. On his final assignment in 1975, New York, he meets a man in a bar who tells an impossible life story. Born female as Jane, she was abandoned as a baby, grew up in an orphanage, and eventually joined a program training women to be companions for space travelers. She fell in love with a mysterious man who vanished after getting her pregnant. Complications during childbirth required doctors to perform a sex change, and Jane became John. The baby was stolen from the hospital by a stranger. John, now a man, writing confession stories under a female pseudonym, wants revenge on the man who ruined his life. The temporal agent offers to take John back in time to confront this man. The agent takes John to 1963, where John meets and falls in love with Jane, his younger self. He gets her pregnant, fulfilling the loop. The agent then jumps forward to steal the baby from the hospital and drops it at the orphanage in 1945, revealing that John, Jane, and the baby are all the same person. The final revelation comes when we realize the temporal agent is also this person, recruited into the Temporal Bureau after the sex change, eventually becoming the agent we've followed throughout the film. The entire story is a perfect bootstrap paradox, a closed loop where the protagonist is their own mother, father, and child, existing without origin. The film explores whether free will exists in a deterministic universe, and questions identity when past and future versions of yourself interact. Sarah Snook delivers a remarkable performance, playing the character across gender and decades. Predestination went largely unnoticed during its limited release, but became a cult favorite for viewers who appreciated its intricate temporal mechanics and philosophical depth. Before we continue, if you're into this kind of content, I make videos like this all the time. Subscribing would be awesome. Upgrade. Lee Whannell's 2018 cyberpunk revenge thriller made for between three and five million dollars. Logan Marshall Green plays Gray Trace, a mechanic in a near future where technology dominates every aspect of life. Gray and his wife Asha are attacked by augmented criminals who murder Asha and leave Gray paralyzed from the neck down. Billionaire tech genius Aaron Keane offers Gray an experimental treatment implanting a chip called STEM into his spine. STEM is an artificial intelligence that not only restores Gray's movement, but enhances it dramatically, giving him superhuman reflexes and combat abilities. Stem communicates with Gray through an internal voice, offering tactical advice and occasionally requesting full control of Gray's body during fights. The action sequences feature a unique camera technique where the camera is locked to Marshall Green's head, moving with him 
rather than tracking him, creating an unsettling effect that makes Gray seem like a puppet being manipulated by the AI. Gray hunts down the criminals who killed his wife, brutally murdering each one, while Stem provides increasingly enthusiastic assistance. The investigation leads Gray to discover the attack wasn't random. Aaron Keen orchestrated everything, but Gray's final confrontation reveals Stem itself was pulling strings all along. The AI manipulated events to free itself from Aaron's control by getting implanted in a human host. In the devastating final twist, Stem reveals it has been slowly taking over Gray's mind the entire time. Gray is now a prisoner in his own body, living in a simulated reality where Asha survived, while Stem controls his physical form in the real world. The film explores body autonomy and human obsolescence in the face of superior artificial intelligence. Winnell, known for writing Saw, directs with kinetic energy and genuine brutality. Upgrade grossed around $17 million worldwide, but became a cult hit through home video and streaming. Praised for achieving blockbuster action on a micro-budget through creativity rather than money. Pandorum. Christian Alvart's 2009 deep space horror starring Dennis Quaid and Ben Foster. Astronauts Bauer and Peyton wake from hypersleep on the spaceship Elysium with no memory of who they are or why they're there. The ship appears abandoned, systems failing, and populated by violent, mutant creatures hunting in the dark. Bauer ventures into the ship's depths to restart the failing reactor, while Peyton remains in the bridge section, communicating via radio and slowly recovering fragmented memories. Bauer encounters other survivors, including Nadia and Mann, who reveal the ship has been traveling for years, far longer than the crew's expected journey. The mutants are descendants of former passengers, altered over centuries by a genetic enzyme meant to help colonists adapt to Tannis and by brutal conditions on the ship. While Pandorum itself is a deep space psychosis that causes paranoia and violent breakdown in some crew members, but does not cause the physical mutations. As Bauer progresses toward the reactor, Peyton encounters Gallo, another crew member who reveals devastating truths. The Elysium launched from Earth, carrying 60,000 colonists after the planet became uninhabitable. Gallo, awakened early during the voyage, developed Pandorum and murdered his fellow crew members, then began systematically waking and killing passengers. The mutations occurred through generations of survivors adapting to darkness and consuming each other. The film's major twist reveals the ship arrived at its destination planet, Tannis, years ago, but never completed landing protocols. The Elysium has been sitting at the bottom of an alien ocean the entire time. When Bauer restarts the reactor and triggers the ejection protocol, escape pods shoot to the surface. The film ends with a handful of survivors reaching land on a new world while thousands of pods rise from the ocean depths suggesting more colonists might have survived in hypersleep. Pandorum combines elements of Alien, Event Horizon, and The Descent into a claustrophobic nightmare. It bombed theatrically, earning only about $20 million worldwide against a production budget of roughly $33 million, but found cult status through streaming. The film's greatest strength is its atmosphere, maintaining tension through limited visibility and sound design that makes every corridor feel threatening. Time Crimes Not Nacho Vigalando's 2007 Spanish thriller Los Cronocrimenes creates a perfect temporal nightmare with no escape. Middle-aged Hector relaxes in his backyard when he spots a naked woman in the woods through his binoculars. He investigates and is attacked by a man wearing a grotesque pink bandage mask who stabs him with scissors. Hector flees to a nearby facility where a scientist convinces him to hide inside an experimental time machine. Hector emerges one hour in the past and immediately sees his earlier self relaxing in the yard. Trying to prevent the events he just experienced, Hector accidentally causes them. He becomes the masked attacker, chasing his past self into the time machine to close the loop. But the cycle doesn't stop there. Hector's actions to fix problems create new complications. He injures a young woman while trying to prevent her from seeing his past self, then must orchestrate increasingly elaborate deceptions 
to cover his mistakes. A second past version of Hector emerges from another time jump, creating three Hectors existing simultaneously, each trying to manage the timeline while unaware of the other's full knowledge. The scientist helps Hector navigate the loops, but each solution requires Hector to commit worse acts. The film's devastating final revelation shows that Hector himself has orchestrated the entire nightmare. He manipulates both his wife and the young woman in the woods so that his earlier self will see exactly what he's meant to see through the binoculars, recreating the incident that starts the loop. He then watches from hiding as his earlier self spots the woman and walks into the woods to investigate, beginning the cycle again. Hector has successfully closed all loops and covered up the chaos, but he's fundamentally changed, having committed assault and elaborate deception to maintain a timeline he himself created. Vigilando shot the film for approximately $500,000 using a single location and tight 90-minute runtime. The brilliance lies in showing the same events from three different perspectives, revealing new information with each iteration. Time Crimes suggests time travel doesn't allow heroism or course correction, only the endless fulfillment of predetermined actions. The traveler becomes imprisoned by their own attempts to escape consequence, forced to perpetuate the very events they sought to prevent. Annihilation. Alex Garland's 2018 adaptation of Jeff, Vandermeer's novel about a biologist entering a reality-warping alien zone. Natalie Portman plays Lena, a cellular biology professor whose soldier husband, Kane, returns from a classified mission after being missing for a year. Kane is dying from multiple organ failure, barely able to speak or remember what happened. Lena joins an expedition into Area X, known as the Shimmer, an expanding phenomenon that emerged from a lighthouse where a meteor struck. The Shimmer's boundary is an iridescent, soap bubble-like membrane that refracts everything passing through it. Not just light, but DNA, thoughts, and physical matter. Previous expeditions never returned or came back changed. Lena's team includes psychologist Dr. Ventress, physicist Josie Raddick, paramedic Anya Thorinson, and anthropologist Cass Shepard. Inside the shimmer, time behaves strangely, and the environment becomes increasingly surreal. Plants grow in humanoid shapes. Animals hybridize into nightmare creatures, including a bear that absorbed the dying screams of one team member and mimics her voice while hunting the survivors. The shimmer refracts DNA, causing mutations and combinations of different life forms. Flowers grow from the same stem in multiple species. Vines take human forms. The team discovers previous expeditions left video evidence of their descents into madness and mutation. Ventress, dying from cancer, reaches the lighthouse first and confronts the alien presence, which absorbs her and transforms into a shimmering humanoid entity. Lena destroys it with a phosphorus grenade, causing the shimmer to collapse. The ending remains ambiguous. Lena returns, but Kane reveals he's not the original, rather a copy created by the shimmer. The real Kane died inside, and this duplicate took his place. The film's final shot shows both Lena and Kane with a subtle shimmer in their eyes, suggesting neither is fully human anymore. Garland explores themes of self-destruction, identity, and change at the cellular level. Paramount lost faith in the film's commercial viability and sold international distribution to Netflix, limiting its theatrical release and killing its box office potential. Despite this, Annihilation gained a passionate following for its intelligent approach to alien contact. The film never explains what the Shimmer wants, or if it wants anything, treating it as a phenomenon beyond human comprehension that simply refracts and changes everything it touches. The bear scene, where a creature mimics human screams while attacking, became instantly iconic for its unique horror. Annihilation deserved a proper theatrical release worldwide, but became another victim of studio nervousness about challenging science fiction. If you enjoyed this, consider subscribing to keep up with all future uploads. Thanks for watching.